about perception. My last book, The Anvil of the Psyche, I, it, the book was about, I was trained as a corporate communications consultant, and my job was to get stuff from complex data, from Wall Street analysts and bankers, and then put it in a way that like an old lady or in Idaho or a doctor in New York could understand what was happening with the share of you know, with the, the, the product launch and whatever their pension plan and so on. That's why I was able to write books on taking a complex subject like psychopathology and put it into a way anyone could understand it. Yeah, that was my job, so I was trained in that. And it was a very interesting ex education because I learned how that people's human beings are very easily fooled because we want to be fooled. Tell me the good news and then tell me the good news. That's literally how we are. We don't like to hear bad shit. We just don't. And these people on Wall Street knew this and people in advertising and, and media know this. And I can remember one, the first time this was ever done, a, a consultant came up to me and it was a, it had been the performance of a pension plan. And the line, the guy showed me the Excel spreadsheet and the line barely went up. You know, so people had really made no money and they'd been promised that the, the pension plan would increase. It was just a dribbly line up like that. And then he says to me, uh, can you make this look really spectacular? And I said, well, I can, I can make it look lovely. You know, I can put nice graphics, nice colors. I can put, yeah, I can, yeah, exactly. I can put, uh, I can put a picture of a, of a classic one of a road leading into a distance, meaning endless horizons for you and your money. And he said, ah, screw that, just change the scale on the graph. So because the graph scale that came, that was shown to the board of directors, went well, from zero to 100, and the actual increase may have took place between 25 and 30, I had to told me to change the scale for up to something like 15 to 50, so the line went like that. <laughs> and then, then he says, and I says, this is fraud, I'm not doing it. And he says, no it's not, you're not lying. And I wasn't lying. And he, said, don't, he says, don't worry about it, <coughs> just do it. And then he says, and I says, okay, and then he said, make sure that the scale numbers are really tiny. <laughs> on the sides, so you don't see the numbers. And, it's, and then he said, make sure that the colors are very appealing to men and women. Make sure that the text on the bottom where it shows the tension wrote is in italics to notify speed. The letters are, are flying along because they're, they're like, you know, running at the bottom. And then the idea to roll the background in the back. And a stupid slogan like, you know, into the future or something. Rubbish like that. And, I, and then put then put into a beautiful glossy book that to be sent out to all of them. And I, I said to myself, this will never fly. Anyone who's anyway, you know, you know, paying attention will know that the graph's a joke, and uh, it won't happen. And it did. No one had a problem with it because they got the they opened up the book. And what they saw was a graph that told them their pension plan was really going up in value. And that, that's what they did. And I learned that the more educated a person was formally, the more easy they were to conceive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because what happens is they've wrapped their ego around their <coughs> status. I'm too educated to be, to be smart, not to be fooled. I'm too educated. I have, too, I have a PhD. I, I, I can't possibly actually it's the other way around. Because what happens is, through a combination of ego and other things, then their actual perception is closed out. This is why the hardest people to get through when you're trying to like, oh, bring up a new political concept or anything are the most educated people. Because they're the ones who are most trapped into a method. That left brain is not only dominant, that the fucking thing is like a turbocharged. It's like, it's, it's, it's a dictator inside that skull. Now, this is kind of dangerous too because there's some new researchers come out from Harvard Medical School that perhaps schizophrenia may be related to overactivity in one hemisphere of the brain compared to the other. And what happens is the cognitive functioning kind of breaks down. And it's very difficult for people to maintain a sense of reality. If you're told the world is black and white and it doesn't turn out to be black and white, that could be very damaging, especially if you're not a kind of, you're a very conservative, very, you know, 
straight laced person. It can be very difficult for those kind of people. And, you know, that's there's a you know some people there's a thing I can remember. I was in hospital, right? I was I was an artist and I was painting, and I used to paint. I used to paint pretty conservative. Well, they weren't that conservative, but kind of pretty interesting kind of landscapes and trees and that kind of thing. And uh, I started to go through what I call a kind of, a, I just wasn't feeling right. Just didn't, I didn't want to get out of bed in the morning. It just came out of nowhere. I just, I felt really bad all the time and I just didn't feel right about myself. And I was, it was kind of like a midlife crisis or something. It happened about four or five years ago. And my art radically changed. It became very abstractive. And I came, it, it just, it was almost like I started to realize I was trying to paint myself better. I was trying to paint, you know, I was trying to, I was trying to get out of this, you know, like, it, and it just seemed that like, it, you know, and I didn't understand what was the problem was, why I felt so rotten, why I used to wake up in the morning shaking and things like that. And I was, you know, I was perfectly fine in other ways, but I just, it was almost like I had this tugging sensation in my gut all the time. I always felt like the sun was like just something that had been like had been damaged in somehow. And as I did it, I started to realise that I had some things from it was goes back to that experience I had as a child when the bomb went off because I was starting to paint red and I started to paint black and I started to paint like things moving apart. And I always remember and I was starting to paint some black circles. Black circles. I was painting black circles constantly, right? And the thing, and, and, and then I was showing it to a friend, and he says to me one day, "What, what are the black circles? I've got these, these, these black circles." And I said, "I don't know, but I just have this thing where I have to kind of paint black circles." And he says, "It's a bit funny. It looks like a car tire warehouse or something." And then at that moment, I swear to God, it was like, it was like uh, a a bomb went off in my brain. And I felt a sensation that went right from my gut, right up into my head and back down again. And he had told me exactly what the black circles were. Because the thing I remembered most of when that bomb exploded was the car tires burning. And I had always stayed with me to smell the rubber burning. And that was what I began to realize that that was the unresolved problem inside me. It's because what happened to me that kid when that bomb went off as a kid, it, it was still there. It was something I'd never really thought about or something on that level. And it had affected me through a post-traumatic stress thing. And that's why I was having certain nightmares and things like that. Even though I didn't see anybody dead or anything, I knew what happened. I heard screams and stuff. Thanks. And that's what the black circles were. They were the smell of the burning tires on the cars that were blowing up the rubber. And then I started to feel so much better. And that's when I started to get into the idea of writing the books about the psychopathic thing because then I just realized that well, if you can if you can trigger something that could actually resolve something that was buried in someone's subconscious, maybe you can get them out of a bad relationship that damaged them. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. And my whole life changed because of it, because then I realized the power of the subconscious was far greater than we're actually given to understanding. And then I had this, I was talking to this woman one day and she told me she had this experience that I'd never had. And it just sounded like the most amazing thing. She said that she was in her car one day. Now this woman is not like any way you would ever, you know, you met her walker, she's very, very respectable, nice little person. She's not flighty. She's not, you know, typical mother. And she said she was, she was waiting to pick up her kids from school one day, sitting in the car, and she just looked. She was sitting in the car and she looked across the road and saw a cherry blossom tree. And then she said the most <coughs> incredible thing happened. I suddenly became aware, in a flash, that myself and the cherry tree were connected. And she said, everything looked so much more beautiful. The grass on the side of the gardens was so beautiful. The sky would never look so blue. And she was overcome by this incredible sensation of absolute peace and tranquility, as well as being struck by the awesomeness of connectivity with the whole universe, herself, and everything else. And you know what happened to her? It absolutely terrified her. Because she thought she was having some kind of problem because she had never been told that that was an actual wonderful thing to happen because it never was explained to her. That that's what Andrew Maslow, the psychologist, called a peak moment or a peak experience, very commonly experienced by a lot of people. And often in the most mundane situations, a guy sitting on a bus, 
someone walking down the street. It just is an explosion of this sensation of the perfect connectedness with everything, everybody. And many people actually see it as a bad thing. Some people who are very religious think they've been touched by God. So it's, e it's actually easier for the ones who've been you know, programmed by mainstream religion because they think, oh God, I've been touched by God. But then they tend to go off the other way and become evangelical. <coughs> they read it all wrong a different way. So she had this experience, and uh, you know, I'd never had that experience. I'd never, I'd always wanted, I'd taken mushrooms, I'd taken LSD, and I'd had, never had a bad experience. It was all fantastic. You know, all the things I never tried like that. And it was, I'd never had a bad experience, and I had like all the amazing things. And in 2010, the painting had really radically changed. I was just painting sort of like streams of consciousness. And it was uh, in June, around this time of year, on a Friday, I think it was, or a Saturday, I painted this kind of abstract shape and everything that happened in it came true 24 hours later. What happened was I had uh, affected gallbladder. If you watch a video called Painting Yourself Out of a Corner, it's me talking at the art convention in Bath a couple of years ago. I go into it, but I literally painted the future. I had predicted, I had predicted the future was happening to me, extremely traumatic. And then I looked through my other work and I found other things and I found I've been doing this for years. I'm an obsessive diarist, I keep diaries all the time. And I keep dream journals. In August 2001, I had a dream that I was standing back, I was in New York on a burning guild girder of a building overlooking the city miles below and trying not to fall in the ruins of a building. I'll actually show it to you, August 9, 2001. Now, did I predict that was going to be a thing in 9-11? I don't know, but that's still pretty freaky anyway. And there was all kinds of things. And I was always have, I became very interested in archetype streams and Jungian ideas of like reaching into the subconscious. And then, you know, when you discover these things, you realize that, you know, your experience as a human being is unbelievably rich and unbelievably big. And yet, we're only told we must fit into a, a narrow bandwidth. I'm a conservative, I'm a labor, blah, 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 blah. And if you show any color, I'm you know, a man, a woman, I'm on this and that, the other, and this is what identity is, and this is everything about me, and there's nothing else. And when that suddenly is challenged by these kind of peak experiences or these shamanic experiences, these sudden kind of uh, things, of premonitions of seeing the future happening, it's, it's, it's happened to so many people. I bet everyone in this room has actually, in some way, had a dream that came true, had a thought about a friend who was going to pick up a phone, you know, anything, something, and he said, oh my God, when I first landed in New York, there was a guy that I knew from Dublin, and I hadn't seen him in about two years, and I was walking around the street at Times Square, and before I saw him, I said to myself, whatever happened to this guy, who I'd never thought about, and I turned the corner, and there he was walking towards me. That happens to people all the time, it's a very common thing. That's because, you know, we all know we don't live in a solid materialistic reality, and our consciousness is all over the human body, so we actually have this ability to somehow, there's a rip, in the reality and these things take part, take take place and they happen. There's just a, just just a fact that's so well documented now. It's undeniable. There's a vast archive. There's probably more to prove that than there is to prove there really in evolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the thing is that we're told it can't be true. It's irrational. It cannot be real. These things cannot happen and yet they always do. And that's because a, they do not want us acknowledging this aspect of ourselves that cannot be controlled, that cannot be processed. So they process us instead. <coughs> they process with magic. If you ask the average person what magic is, they would say abracadabra and all this stuff. No, magic is actually a science. Magic is this, the art and science of changing, changing the reality or changing perceptions or changing someone in conformity with will. Basically that means making someone believe something or doing something to change, to bring about change in a material world that was actually manifested within will, in the imagination. And it's called an art because some people are better at it than others. And it's called a science because it follows various processes to get to that point. So for instance, all magic is if you are humming a tune in your head, you go home, you play on the guitar, and you record it, that's magic. You brought something from the material world, from the world of the imagination, into the material world. A carpenter, when he 
builds a you know, bookshelf. He sees it, he thinks it in his head. He uses a pen or a pencil to draw the design. That's his magic wand. Then he builds it from the plants. Now, when you think about that, how awesome that is, that every single one of us has the ability to take something that didn't exist in the material world and bring it into reality. Just think about that. And yet, whenever you, when you're told that in school, how awesome that is, when a kid was given a piece of clay and made a figure, that kid made something that didn't exist before, that was in his head, that's magic. That's, what, that's the true definition of magic. But unfortunately, we've never been told this because they tell us that it doesn't exist and yet they use it on us all the time. We are actually, you know, they're all, they really are stage musicians, magicians in art and in advertising and marketing. And I'll give you an incredible example of how they actually do magic on us. Do you ever, do you, do you know why the news is on, on the main TV news is on three times a day? Say like one o'clock, six o'clock, nine or ten o'clock. Everywhere around the world, right? The format's exactly the same. There's a reason for that. We're being medicated. We're being medicated to make us addicted to the news. And that's why we watch the same stories three times a day. What happens is, say that the news comes on, <laughs> it comes in with a bang. Some gobshite has some papers and he's like, some shit, happened, some shit happened today. Let's talk to the shithead over here. I'm outside the building with some shit that's horrible. And and, you know, it's a kind of crap. Hypervigilance. They're building up your hypervigilance. They're building up your adrenaline. They're building up your blood pressure. They're doing it to the show. Norepinephrine, the stress hormone, is firing from the reptilian complex in your brain cell. It's flooding around the back of the brain. Your optical nerves, it's spurring up where your optical nerves go to the back here. And you, from your, the op, right at the, at the down mm -hmm. the same part of the brain, it's being flooded with stress hormones. So your eyes, your eyes go like this, oh shit, mm -hmm. oh this is awful news. They're going to introduce a new tax, they may have austerity. It's just terrible, right? And it goes on, it goes on. And then at the end of the show, and now, here's a pic, here's a little story about a duck that let its, it let its duckings across the road and the policeman stopped the traffic. And that's the dopamine neurotransmitter. I the it. adverts were the dopamine. What's that? I thought the adverts were. The news tells you to stay in fear, then you have the adverts. Everything is an advert. The news is an advertisement mm -hmm. for government policy. That's all the news is. It's nothing else. And so you get the flood of dopamine at the end, and then you suddenly go, you feel good. That's the one o'clock news over. We got through that shit, right? <laughs> that trauma. You go through the day, you have a few cups of coffee, right? It's getting near four o'clock. Liturgy, it's coming up again. It's six o'clock. <laughs> this prick is back on. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And he's looking all so serious. And then they also have the guy, the, the good looking woman who's the eye candy, and that kind of thing. And that's also that's playing on all kinds of other things like, you know, uh, cognitive dissonance where you hold two ideas at the same time you're hearing a horrible news story but you fancy the girl who's reading the news that's the yeah, I mean, that was that's, that's why they put them up there it's actually a mess with your head you can't think straight and the government policy tells you that you have to do this and then it finishes up with the ducks again and then it happens at nine and then you say no no they get get lost and go to bed and that's why i always say to people like the greatest revolutionary act in 2013 is to get rid of television that's actually more of a revolutionary act today than going down to City Hall and throwing petrol bombs in the building. Because that's where the actual prison is, it's in the consciousness. It's right there. So they, they do this with a hallmark moments, the hallmark card. You see, our, our understanding of love is, is very different than what we used, we used to be. You know, the whole thing of love and romance, this whole thing of it, you know, it's like you have to be, what, what love is, is being like in the init initial infatuation stage forever. Forever. You know, it does like that. But that's not how life is. It doesn't work that way. It's hard. You know, and you have like, you know, this is what the whole thing of like these hallmark moments of the anniversaries and you have to do this is try and maintain and get back to where it was in the early days. But that's not a natural thing. It's nice. Everybody loves falling in love. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. But that's also chemicals in your brain as well. That's serotonin, you know, and so on and other, other, other things.
things. That's the, that, but that doesn't mean that that's chemical love. Chemical love is very different than real love. Chemical love is when you can get over the lovey-dovey stuff and still be together years later when he or she is sick and you take care of them. That's the real love. That's the real one. But, but they've given us this, this kind of thing that started with the Brontes. I always found that interesting. I went to Howard where they buried, where the Brontes came from. And yet none of them really had any... These, are, these were like the... These women are considered the ground zero for what romance and love is. And yet, all the, yet they never had a real decent relationship. It's really funny to me like that this is what this tragic idea of the tragic love that we must get it out of the way now. So it's dark, you know, it's gothic and kind of thing at the same time. As well as this whole thing, it has to be this kind of euphoria that goes on forever. You can't be high forever on everything, go Mahadi, it's I. You can't be high in love forever. But you can be in love forever. And again, people they're they're not really reacting to how things are. They're not really reacting how they should be. They're artificially being changed by hormones and they're being artificially changed by well, you know, external stimuli that has to be behaving and concerned about things and believing images of themselves that aren't necessarily real. You understand that? Like you really strip yourself away, you say, Who am I really? Who are you really? <coughs> well who you really are is not the person that you, that you think you are. Your, your name, your job, your age, that's not the apparent what you are is behind that. Everything else that is like the layers of an onion that's been put on top. And you see, like, one of the things I learned about psychopaths is they, they're, they're, they're phenomenal at making people do what, become and change them in ways they don't want to be. And make it to a new person without them knowing it. I mean, so many people who contact me who have been in a relationship with a psychopath, their friends were all saying, get away from him, you've changed completely. You're behaving. Not, that's not, you're not the same person, and the person will be saying, I'm exactly who I've always been. I didn't change. What they do is they play on the person's insecurities. They love bomb them. Love bombing is what cults do as well. Oh, we all love you, we all love you, and they fully full of these hormones. And then this love bombing is taken away, removed. And you become, what can I do to get that love back, that feeling back? You see, that's that's... That's like a slavery. That's like a, you're a slave to this stuff, just like you're a slave to the news if you have a TV. And that's what's considered sane. Sanity is, is considered being a slave to the external stimuli of mass media and culture and politics, which are nothing more than hormonal triggers playing on our anxieties, our fears, and our insecurities. That's Western modern people. That's what we are. And yet, if you see someone who sees outside that, they're considered crazy. And yet, so many of those people have more to offer than any, you know, hotshot marketing or media guy. I was just reading there, like some of the things that some people have been. Van Gogh was diagnosed as psychotic. Van Gogh was the psychotic. Yeah, the guy man had problems. Yeah, he did. She he did. He did commit suicide. But yet, if you look at the soul of the man, he was driven with nothing but other than you know, wanting to do good for the human race. He was initially a missionary, a Christian missionary among the poor in Belgium. And he wanted to actually genuinely help these people. He felt bad for them. You know, he was, his, he was, his motivations were good, but it led him into insanity. It's very similar with Nietzsche as well. Now, Van Gogh is so interesting. This guy is supposed to be psychotic. Yet, you know, he's basically... Not forget art, just forget post-impressionism, forget art what an amazing artist he was. This predictive quality. He died about 20, 25 years before the invention and discovery of quantum physics, <coughs> which basically believes that the, we live, well, it's a fact that we don't live in a material world. And basically, these are all subatomic particles that are swirling in space, and it's only our perceptions that bring them together. And if you look at paintings like Starry Night and the way the skies are done, they're exactly how things like the Higgs bosons and stuff have been, you know, conceptualized. This is a man who saw this stuff. He somehow tapped in. This has been shown over and over again. Artists have the ability to see the future. We well, actually believe the ability is to make the future. They're making the future happen. And this blew his mind. He couldn't handle it because he was trying to fit a sort of an indigenous shamanic experience into a Dutch 
Presbyterian brain. You know what I mean? Just think about that. How most difficult is it? Any wonder the man killed himself? Just think about that. He was having a download, an unbelievable download, that he was actually beginning to see that reality wasn't real, that it was made up of uh, subatomic particles that were put there by perception. And his brush strokes are such a, you know, they, you can see he's, he's, he's getting it. He's understanding it, that reality is it's not, it's, not so, it's not so solid. There's a flux and a flexibility to it. And you see that in his work, all these swirls and all these spirals. This is all quantum fields. This is quantum matter. This is this is magnetic fields. He's getting it. He's 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 moving towards it. And I think it's one of his last paintings before he, he finally killed himself. Is the the crows are flying over the chrome field. And I actually believe that what he was painting was the his actual his departure from reality. The crows were the crows were leaving reality. He actually knew then that like they, he did not live in a solid reality world. If you read some of his letters to his brother Theo, you can see he's struggling. He's struggling to try and understand because what happened was Van Gogh was a shaman. He was absolutely a shaman. He was ha he was having an incredible download, but he didn't have the tools to deal with it. Just like the woman I told you about had the peak experience by like the school. She thought there was something wrong with her when she had the most beautiful experience in the world. Because she couldn't fit it into her materialistic educated brain. It didn't fit with that program.